if, if people don't know who I am, I'm Lee Lockman. I'm the trumpet player with the group Chicago. And uh, Jeff has asked me to come on to uh, talk. I mean, I'm not even really sure what we're going to talk about other than uh, where I came from, and which is Chicago. And uh, I went to school in uh, Elmwood Park in uh, the suburb of Chicago. Um, and I went to a grade school where they had a concert band. Uh, and they did, we, we did plays and all, and all kinds of, you know, stuff that would, um, unbeknownst to me, be something that eventually I was going to be getting into. But at 11 years old, my dad asked me if I wanted to um, play the trumpet. You know, he played the trumpet in the army. He was a, um, he was a, 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 was a chief warrant officer, I think for the uh, Army Air Force, the both, both the, they were combined in the uh, World War II wow. and, uh, and then separated after that. But uh, yeah, he was the band leader and he would have all of these guys from uh, the big bands around the country, when they got drafted to go into WW2, they'd come through his band first. And, you know, so he, he'd have these guys from Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and all these you know, huge bands yeah. come in and be playing. And before they went overseas, uh, he used to uh, look the other way when they would go AWOL on the weekends and go play gigs and get drunk and high or whatever it was. You come back and, and he would sort of let them sneak back in. And but he never liked that. He, ne he didn't like the booze and the drugs. And he thought there was something weird with that. And um, I, of course, welcomed it. <laughs> and, I don't know why, and I'm not sure why I'm still standing, but, but here we are. Yeah. He, uh, he got out of the army and he left music altogether. Uh, the only thing he brought home from the, from the, uh, the war times was his horn. And he had that up in the attic. So that was the first horn. It was a Martin, uh, Martin 404 or so, or uh, no, 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 it wasn't the Martin. It was it was the uh, a Bach Stradivarius. Oh wow! Yeah, that he had, and it was, it was pretty nice. And uh, I think it was the Mount Vernon. Cool. Yeah, and I played that horn first, and I ended up. You know, I I guess he had played it quite a bit, and uh, so I ended up blowing it out while I was playing with the band and then I started playing, uh, uh, you know, like Holton horns and stuff like that. I had a Doc Severinsen model horn for a while. And, uh, uh, but first things first, I, I went to the grade school and uh, sat down with the band director, uh, Ralph Meltzer. And he looked at my teeth, and she, you know, show me your teeth. And yeah, he figured that they were in alignment to the point where I wasn't gonna hurt myself by putting a mouthpiece and trying to shove that down my throat. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, it'll work out if you try to put a trumpet. So it started there. And then I, stayed, I started taking private lessons with a guy named John Nuzo, who is now deceased, uh, but he was very good. And uh, uh, his mother used to make uh, lunch for us every time we would come over for a lesson. So, oh, so cool. my dad and I would go over and eat and and uh, play Schlossberg exercises and stuff like that. And uh, so I, I had a good time and that started bringing me along. And eventually when I got to high school, uh, the same band director that my dad had when he was a kid was teaching at St. Mel High School in Chicago. Um, and I had to take uh, one, two, three buses to get to high school which was highly unusual, but the school that was closest did not have a band. So, and the band director, of course, my dad knew him uh, uh, intimately. So we went to St. Mel. I went to St. Mel for four years and that was uh, Tom Fabish. And he, would, he did the, the uh, Catholic Youth Organization, the CYO band. So I met a lot of players over there and uh, uh, I played in the school band for all of the, the sock hops and 
and um, uh, the intramural basketball games and stuff, you know, the rah, rah, rah stuff yeah. and the football games. So I never had to put, you know, put uh, equipment on, go out on the field and hurt myself, but, you know, <laughs> uh, tackling somebody. I, I never stopped playing. The only thing I did was intramural basketball in between classes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember hitting, I, you know, one of those corner shots was the last second shot. So I was a hero for about 20 minutes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, we won. <laughs> <laughs> it was Lock Nine that put it in. <laughs> cool. But, uh, I'm not too too good at basketball. Well, my son. I wasn't too much into sports either. I did soccer, yeah, yeah. soccer and baseball, but I was not the star player. I liked soccer, but I, w I wasn't into anything beyond that. Well, I was pre-soccer. There yeah. was no when I was coming up. Right. Soccer was a, a distant thing that was other countries did that. Right. Not, yeah. And uh, it's amazing how far it's come now to, to making it really worldwide yeah and now we have Messi that just opened up last night i think right he just played his first game in in miami oh really okay yeah, so Lionel messi who is one of the you know greatest players of all time one of those guys he is now in america playing soccer cool. so yeah sort of like when when uh, wayne gretzky came uh to los angeles uh kings uh brought hockey to america right you know, i'm not sure what the canadians thought of that but they probably <laughs> thought he was you're a traitor what are I you doing have, i used to have a roommate in college that was big soccer or big um hockey fan and i remember when that happened yeah oh yeah that was a big deal and now the the messy thing is a big deal in soccer or football whichever yeah. you want because they they actually use their feet yeah <laughs> we use arms legs whatever we got <laughs> kick it you know but not pass it around right we pass it around with our arms yeah anyway so i'm playing um you know the sock cops and all of that stuff with and and uh and then i meet these guys uh that turned out to be chicago uh i met terry uh the, there was a, a local band in Chicago called the Missing Links, and they were How playing. Old were you were you still in high school at that time? It was at the end of high school. I was like a uh, senior in high school, I think, when I met I met uh, Walt and Terry, or or maybe it, it, I might have been. Uh, it might I might have graduated high school, and I was in uh, first year of college at DePaul University, and I met uh, Walt. And he was in the band called The Missing Links. And I would go sit in with those guys. And, you know, so we were playing R&D tunes and, and stuff. It was a lot of fun. Just, you know, stuff that you hear on the radio, or at least that you did hear on the radio at the time. Yeah. And, and Terry Kath was playing bass with that band. Uh, the guitar player's uh, dad was uh, the manager of the band. So he, you know, he had his son playing the guitar. Wasn't that good of a guitar player. Uh, and Terry played bass so well that he made up for the stuff that the guitar player didn't do. <laughs> he, was, he was like doing Jimi Hendrix stuff on the bass. Well, <laughs> filling out the song that wow. uh, the guitar player could not do. So, yeah. and then when he sang, it was like, oh my God, this guy is unbelievable. Wow. Terry's just so great, you know. He would bring you to tears when he would sing a ballad, you know. Yeah, it's, it's still it's mind-boggling how good it was. Yeah. Uh, and then I started hearing him play guitar. Uh, after the band broke up, when they when the band broke up because they they were trying to make it and they had a, a record out and blah blah blah, like everybody tries to get a record out and see if it works or not. With uh, like the uh, Dick Clark uh, cavalcade of stars that used to travel around the country. Uh -huh. The Links were the backup band for everybody that came out on stage. Oh, cool. so playing behind the Shirelles and and uh, any of the single artists that would come out on the road, and uh, they would do like two or three songs with each guy. So 
and they were they were the backup band for everybody cool. and so they had a lot of experience of how to do it and how to you know a stage presence yeah right? and uh, uh when that band broke up walt and danny decided to uh uh form another band and uh uh became chicago and we we were listening to a trombone player playing around in at DePaul University in the practice rooms of Jimmy Panko. So we asked him to come and we, we got together at Walt's basement and we've been together ever since. Me, uh Jimmy and Robert are still with the band from we've been with the band since February nineteen sixty seven. Wow. Uh, it'll be fifty seven years in two thousand twenty four. February two thousand four. I, mean, I it's like, and I'm talking to you. Yeah. Well, I was born December twenty ninth of nineteen sixty seven. So you guys were around before I was born. And That's I, right. I think I told. Already. I think I told you before. The reason why there were two two things in my life where I knew I wanted to play trumpet when I was in first grade, I heard Doc Severinsen on the Tonight Show band. And yep. I was just obsessed with the trumpet from that point. And my parents yep. didn't want me to play music at all because I had two sisters that, and they were like, we're not going to force you to practice and go through all that again. Just forget it. And, uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't stop. I was like, I want to play trumpet. Well, then I kept begging him, kept begging him. And then I went to a friend's birthday party and I grew up in Bakersfield, California. And so my friend, we were in third grade, and he took me and a group of friends to Six Flags Magic Mountain. Okay. And, and on the, in the radio on the car, I probably heard Saturday in the Park at least twice. And then okay. as I was walking through Magic Mountain, I probably heard that song like four or five times. And okay. I was like, that's the trumpet. That's so cool. I want to. <laughs> so our fifth album was out. Yeah. Right and that was. And so that was third grade, and I just would not stop begging my parents till I got a trumpet in fourth grade. So, it was All right. like, so That's very you and Doc are the two people where I was like, the sound of the trumpet is like yeah. stuck in my brain from that, you know? Right, right. That's cool. So, so after you formed the band, like what, like we were talking a little bit earlier, like did you have like any dreams of what you thought you guys might do? And I mean, I know you probably didn't Not really. know where it would go. We had, we thought we were going to go to Vegas and be like, uh, you know, one of the bands in the, the little bars in, in Vegas, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, wear suits and do uh, steps and, you know, like a little show type thing. We, and we realized pretty quickly that we weren't, weren't, weren't really cut out for that. You know, we we went and bought suits and took pictures. We in a in a foundation of a building, and we called ourselves the Music Foundation. And uh, no, I don't. People don't really even know that we called ourselves that for because it only lasted like a month or two that we that we did that. And then, uh, but we were playing clubs in Chicago, and we played a place a place called Barnaby's, and. Uh, all of the other clubs that we played, except Barnaby's, wanted us to play top 40 tunes. The guy at Barnaby's said, you can play anything you want. If you want to play, uh, 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 you know, new music that you guys are writing, original stuff, you can play that here. And oh. the audience didn't like it as, as much, of course, but we would get to try out songs at Barnaby's. And, uh, but we started building a reputation to the point where it was, um, we we were taking some of the crowd, and we were we were uh, like take when I on our breaks we would do 45, 15, and five shows a night, you know, or five sets a night, sometimes six on the weekends, wow. but it was forty five on, fifteen off. So you, as you're going through the night, you repeat a bunch of songs because you don't know that many songs, but you know <laughs> we knew enough to get through you know two three hours, but but uh, you have to keep repeating songs, especially the stuff that people wanted to hear again. You know, they yeah. keep quest for it. 
So you you do those things. And so at uh, that time, had you had you written any of the songs that anyone would recognize later no. on the albums? No. No, not not yet. No. But we were doing we were doing uh, 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 arrangements of other people's hits, stuff that we became sort of uh, very good at uh, to take another song that had already been established hit and make a like a we ended up calling them Chicago arrangements. Yeah, uh, personalized the arrangement to fit our band, and uh, so we did a lot of that stuff and. Unfortunately, uh, that stuff is sort of lost to the memory banks and it never got recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we, uh, I'm we even blanking out on some of the titles that we, that we did, uh, but it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, oh yeah, we did, we did one called Hold On, I'm Coming. And uh, uh, the Terry uh, came up with the intro, I think it was the, uh, 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 Bach, uh, something, Bach concerto in C minor or something like that, and and, and then that led into the song, and okay. it, it was pretty cool. And then we did something else after that. I I mean I can't remember how the how the if I heard it again, we played it so many times that that. It would come flooding back to me immediately, but right now I, I can't remember <laughs> to save my life. But it was it was a lot of fun, and uh, we had uh, it was because of Vanilla Fudge when Vanilla Fudge was recording, they would do these types of arrangements on other people's songs. So we did a couple of their tunes, and then we started arranging songs on our own. And when we met Robert Lamb, he had already a book of like 50 songs. Oh, wow. And yeah. So we started messing around with a couple of those. And we, we played a couple uh, at uh, various clubs where the guys were really sticklers for the top 40 tunes, and they, they, they fired us. So <laughs> it, it came to a point pretty quickly that, that we would either move up to the next step, whatever that step is, or we would be you know, looking for our next job, wow. either musical or, you know, what am I going to do with my life type stuff like everybody else has to deal with. Yeah. So and, how did it, how did it work out? When, what made you guys decide to, like, didn't you move to California and do all that? Like where we was moved to California? Yeah. 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 Uh, Gersio moved us out to California. Uh, he had gone to DePaul University with us and uh, graduated and he was doing uh, Chad and Jeremy. Uh, he was, I think he was playing bass with Chad and Jeremy, Jimmy Garcia. And then he, I think he started producing them or he somehow got into production and uh, moved us out to California. And we went out to California and started learning and writing the songs for the first album. And rehearsing those in a, in a house on Holland Drive in Los Angeles. Wow. Cool. When we first moved out there, we we uh, it was like a whole new world. Yeah, L.A. was like, you know, palm trees. Where? Oh my God! This is like nothing we had ever imagined seeing before, it, and uh, changed our lives. And uh, so a bunch of the guys drove out. Me, Terry, and Robert, I think, uh, flew out and stayed in a, a hotel somewhere in like Hollywood and Vine or Hollywood and Cahuenga or something like yeah. that. And then uh, uh, Garcio found us a house to live in on Holly Drive. And we went there and we uh, used the dining room for a bedroom and the living room for a bedroom and then the bedrooms for bedrooms. <laughs> and we rehearsed in the, in the living room. So that would get converted from a bedroom into like rehearsal time we just, you know, sit around and start playing. And, um, you know, amazingly enough, we didn't get too many complaints for, for you know, too, too much noise in the neighborhood. I, they must have liked what we sounded like even back then. So, <laughs> and we, you know, we didn't try to shove it down their throats by playing too late at night either. Yeah. Yeah, so. So it was how, a lot long did it, how long person. did it? By the time we, by the time we, uh, recorded the songs and, and uh, 
we, we had made a, de a, a deal with Clive Davis uh, to record the, the first album. We went to New York to record it and um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel were recording in the same studio that we were using during the day. So they had, they had uh, that studio locked out during the day. We would record from um, midnight to uh, eight in the morning. Wow. Yeah. So we'd come in with a, a, a with our horns and, and set up, uh, you know, in the dark of night. And it took us, I think it took us like two weeks or something to record the first album because we knew the songs back and backwards and forwards already. Yeah. But we had never recorded before. So we had to learn the process of doing that. And those mics pick up everything. So we were we were uh, intimidated by the microphones and um, learned, obviously learned how to use it as we were going through um, and became more comfortable as we recorded more albums. Initially, we thought it was gonna be one album and that's it, you know, you're done. And yeah. most bands last, what, two to five years? Yeah. If, you know, if five years is a long stretch for a rock and roll band. Yeah. And, you know, you get two, three hits. If you're lucky, you get one, one hit if you're lucky. And um, when we released the songs off of the first album, AM radio did not play them because they said we hadn't had, a, we didn't have a hit yet, which is, you know, catch 22. How are you going to have a hit if you don't get it played? Right. You know, that didn't make any sense. So how so did that, how did that happen? Had, or the second album. The, the first album was successful because we took it to every college town in America, just about. We played everywhere and we played over like 250 shows, over 200 shows. And it took, uh, you know, almost the entire year to accomplish that. So we were always on the road playing somewhere. Wow. And so uh the rate the college radio stations were playing the entire album oh. so people our age became used to and familiar with everything that we did when the second album came out and and that's why we're successful because we were selling albums to those guys those right those, our age and uh uh the success of of that the college uh crowd allowed us to do this the second album and ballet for a girl in Buchanan was on that am radio decided that they liked make me smile so they weren't going to play the entire 14 minutes uh you know with all of that uh, uh orchestral type stuff in the center is it all that music would just cut that stuff out <laughs> <laughs> so they they took make me smile uh, and the the beginning of Make Me Smile up into the guitar solo. And then we cut right back to the uh, the end of the song, which is the reprise, Make Me Smile reprise. And put those together. It was like uh, three minutes, three, I think 3.30, three and a half minutes, which is the uh, length of time that they would allow someone to put music on the radio because they had to do all of their ads and stuff. Right? So they had a set time limit for songs pretty much three yeah. minutes three and a half minutes and uh i think the beatles were the only ones that were able to go over that but you know la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah, that was about 20 minutes right I, 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 I think it was seven minutes something, yeah. something insane the uh, the length that the radio would play that because they were the beatles and yeah. the beatles became you know worldwide phenomenon well, Make Me Smile became a hit, our, our first hit. And once that was a hit, we went back and re-released Beginnings, uh, Questions, Does Anybody Really Know What Time It Is? And they all became hits. And because we had had a hit already, they played them. And they became uh, very big hits. And we... By the time we went to, to Europe, we were bigger stars in Europe than we were in America. And that's that's when, uh, that's still back when 
uh, AM radio was not playing anything. But in Europe, we were huge stars, which was completely awkward for us because <laughs> we were still playing like we were in a club, really, you know, clumped together. And no matter how big the stage was, we were like standing right next to each other. <laughs> we were used to, right? So how big yeah. were the how big were the venues and stuff when you went? To oh, some of them were like forty feet, you know. Yeah, and we were, we were like clumped in the center of the stage. <laughs> we probably started spreading out somewhat because you know there was just more room. Yeah. So that was the beginning of how to get used to being a, a, a recording, or not a recording artist, but a, a concert uh, um, artist that was, you know, front and center, the top bill. Right. right? And uh, so were they arenas or or what kind of, what sorts of things were they they were more arenas and and uh uh they were we initially started playing some clubs in europe and and th that was very successful we played uh, um uh in uh switzerland we played in france we played uh in the little clubs in france they they would go gee go go Chico, go, Chico, go. It, it was very cool. And we were just kids running around the world. We had yeah. no idea. We were doing, just having fun playing music. And uh, it, it was pretty cool. So we come back to America and the album is, uh, the album was, was successful. And we were recording the, the second album, Make Me Smile becomes successful. We start re-releasing the songs and and we were like underground successes, you know. Oh my God, these guys are so far ahead of their time. Woo, they're, you know they're going to be around for. We release the songs and they become hits as as singles, and the same people who said we were way ahead of our time started saying that we sold out because now we were successful and had hits. We hadn't changed one note on those <laughs> records. You know who would have time to do that in the first place, but. But we hadn't changed the note, and the the songs were hit records now, and we were more commercial. Yeah, and we weren't the new kids on the block, you know, the favorite <laughs> color anymore. And we we started going, you know, something's wrong with this picture. And you know, and Robert was writing more politically oriented type stuff, just things that people were thinking, but not. We had a a, a platform where you could actually say that. Yeah. And it would song like uh, like dialogue, for instance, and uh, which you know the 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 lyrics and dialogue still make sense today, like they did fifty years ago when he wrote the song. So, and these political people would come and and talk to us and and want to uh, want us to join the Democratic Party, young Demo young Democrats, and stuff like that. And we would just point and go go talk to Robert. <laughs> we're, we're just interested in playing music so have a good day and leave us alone thank you yeah <laughs> and, <laughs> and and robert was you know thinking more politically minded thinking of 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 um, how other people that were growing up in the same period as as us were thinking as well uh but even he was more interested in playing music than becoming a politician. Right. And we, we tended more towards the music as, as you saw in, in, uh, in, you know, as we made more records, they became more musical and, you know, take, taking chances and stuff. Yeah. And then as you know, we come, become more successful and start making, uh, you know, the ballads start becoming, um, hit records just you and me and uh, uh i've been searching so long uh and then if you leave me now came out i think it was our 10th album and uh that became a worldwide hit every country that existed it was number one in. wow like 250 countries in the world we were number one in every country that's amazing and yeah, so we won a Grammy for that, uh, it, and you can't win it as a band because it, 
single only single artist can can win those types of awards. So we won it as a, the best duo or a band or best duo or group, something like that. We won a Grammy for that, <laughs> and so we were winning for album covers and and things like that. But you know, when you're too musical, it's it's people don't know what to think. <laughs> like, really, to this day, if it's too musical, they don't understand. They want to see one artist. They want to see the solo guy. They want to see the up front. And th that that became a problem with us when we started doing videos because the director of the video would come and say, so so who's the leader of the band? What do you mean? There's no leader. You shoot everybody. Well, I can't do that. There's no focus. So they would look for the guy singing the song. That's, you know, MTV. Yeah. The guy singing the song is the guy on the camera. And you know, little shots of the other guys as you go through the through the tune, but uh, you know that was a, a rude awakening as well. And somehow we have passed all of the tests and and uh, criteria, everything that you've you needed to do to make yourself successful. We've accomplished everything that is a stumbling block that would usually uh, announce the end of the band. Like uh, the like our first uh, when we got to the ninth album that was a greatest hits album, and normally that's the end of the road. You do a greatest hits album, you're on your way out, right? <laughs> now we've had what four or five uh, greatest hits albums <laughs> out of our thirty eight albums, right? Yeah, and, and, and there was no way we could do what we've been doing, and uh, I I don't know how it's become successful. And trumpet playing wise, uh. It was always loud. And, you know, the, as we had monitors on stage, the monitors, everyone always wanted to hear themselves better and louder than the guy next to them. And then, you know, um, I don't remember anybody ever saying, turn this one down. <laughs> you know, that's when I started going, I, I can't handle this at all. I, this is way too loud. I started putting uh, cigarette filters in my ears because I just couldn't hand, yeah. handle it. And I could actually hear the monitors better when I did that. And uh, after a while, I, I went, you know what, turn mine down. I, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't keep up with this. And you keep trying to play louder and it doesn't work. Right. You're over, you end up with no chops at the end, but at the end of a song, because Jimmy wrote stuff that, there was very little rest in yeah. the ballet for a girl in Buchanan is as hard today as it was the day we recorded it. And it hasn't gotten any easier, you know? So when, when, when people come in after, uh, when someone ends up having to leave the band for whatever reasoning, uh, comes up, um, I tell them to learn the introduction and ballet first. Because those those are the the most demanding songs, and with the most changes and tempo changes and and key changes and and uh, ensembles and all of the other stuff that goes along with it, and everything else is is not easy, but uh, easier than those tunes. So, uh, you know, I, I I still go out at the beginning of a tour, and even practicing every day it's not like playing on stage the the intensity of playing on stage and with the adrenaline and the crowd and everything going on it's it's always fun but the chops have to go back I'm into in, i meant to mention something to you like you know a couple of weeks ago when when we were going to try to do this in person i saw you in long island it's like right. i knew you were sick and I, I oh was that's curious. right yeah yeah and i mean i knew that you're wearing the coat and you're telling me how you're trying to sweat it out and everything but <laughs> i couldn't believe you were singing and the other thing i was looking like you look like you're genuinely happy having a good time <laughs> even oh, yeah. though i know you're really sick so well, you feel I don't like, think you, but people aren't interested in whether you're sick or not they just want a good show right but do you, you know? feel that like the show actually kind of pumps you up and makes you feel even better oh yeah yeah oh, 
at the end mean, of the you, look, you I would never have guessed that you were feeling as sick as I knew you were. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was affecting uh my breathing too. So and and you know that's another because I I recommend that anybody doing the breathing exercises never quit <laughs> doing them. Never <laughs> don't do what I did. Because <laughs> it's it's not easy to get back into it again. Right. And, are rebuilding it because it it takes so much time to build that that uh you know take an easy breath and it's like you know 10 times more air than any other human being if yeah. you do it the right way and you keep consistent at it uh you are going to be able to play those high r's with no problem at all because when you figure out that you lift your chest take a breath and blow it sounds easy, but there's a lot more involved with it. And you know the how you how you uh, uh, attack the first note, the K tongue, the first K tongue, and and move on from there. It, it's just amazing the things that you will be able to do, but never stop the breathing exercises. Yeah, I think I think the first time I think the first time I ever saw you play and we talked backstage, the first thing you said to me was. I did my breathing exercises <laughs> before the show. <laughs> I know. You got to do cool. warm-up breathing exercises, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And that's when I was still doing them. But uh, not to the intensity that I was doing them before. And yeah. Is that, you know, I got up to like, uh, uh, you know, 10 jog. And it was it was still improving. Yeah. You know. You know. 10 jog is a long time between breaths. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, for me, eight jogging eight is about where it's like I can kind of go indefinitely, but once I get to jog right. nine or jog 10, I have to like stop and catch. Oh, yeah. After a while. <laughs> and then you, you get to a point where you can have, you can get that. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then, then you just, when you get to jog 10, then you just start adding more time yeah yeah so 40 minutes 50 minutes as much as you can and you can just do it but you know there isn't there's only so much time in the day right <laughs> um what are so you maybe, gonna run all day what's wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can explain how um when you when you met paul and paul Witt and got into the clock warden stuff and what your playing was like before that and after those changes and then what you've noticed in all that time since then until now and what yeah because i think that there were some neat things you shared with me recently on the phone that i thought well i'm just a that from what i gathered you still feel like you're improving still in your playing yeah, yeah I, is, I, I think that's encouraging to anyone because sometimes i think people think oh i'm just like trying to maintain or whatever but it's like you're still improving and it's getting easier and that's that's cool well maintaining is something that can be done and uh, you know uh, as we're practicing once you get to a show you, you're on you know whatever you're doing practice wise you forget all of that stuff and you just play the show and you do whatever you need to do to make it yeah right? and uh the more times you do the claude gordon exercises and do everything correctly and work with the metronome and build up slowly and if you get to a point where it's too fast for the metronome you take it back down three clicks and play it to where you can play it right in time and then move it up one click as you do that move it up the next click and then and so on and every time you get to a point where you can't do it you take it back down three clicks right, right. over and over. the more times you do stuff correctly the harder it is to screw it up when you have when you're on you know on the the front lines as it were playing right. the show and uh you know something really tough is coming up you handle it differently as you go through it and it becomes easier as you go through but you have to keep doing it consistently and uh Claude Gordon stuff works that way. I mean, there are other methods of how to get to the same place. And, you know, so there's always that controversy of 
you know, Claude's not the, the only guy. It's true. There are other ways to, to uh, get there. This one works. I can yeah. guarantee it. I've done it. Yeah. I haven't done all of the other methods, but I have watched other people and taken things that I see from how they just how they're standing and how they're holding their horn, how they're, you know, uh, doing things so easily. And, you know, you can see their lips like moving up and down. Yeah. How did he do that? You know, and then as you start playing, all of a sudden you feel that as that that movement while you're playing and you feel what it feels like. Oh, I'm going to need to keep doing that because yeah. that works. Yeah. That's why I sounded so good. Yeah. I can I can sound that good too. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so uh, we were doing, um, we, we started doing the videos. The MTV thing came and uh, we start doing videos. The directors come to us. We, you know, who you're going to focus on, blah, blah, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, so the singer gets focused on and we're fighting over who who's going to get the rest of the shots during a three minute song, right? Well, because we everybody needs airtime, so we're fighting with the manager as to how we're going to get on there and stuff. It turns out that Paul Witt knew one of the the directors when we did uh, uh, Chasing the Wind, and I, well, I know it was Chasing the Wind because we were out in in Las Vegas where those uh, the uh, wind turbines are. Oh yeah, yeah. we were doing a, a, a and and Paul came to the shoot. And uh, we started talking about trumpet and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting all these things and, and I'm playing stuff that's more difficult than higher notes and stuff. And I said, I know when I, once I get out of the room and start blowing my ass off that I'm going to get tired and have to take some of this stuff down an octave because I just won't have enough uh, endurance to keep going because I end up blowing myself out. I try not to play that loud, but inevitably I can't compete with someone who can turn a knob and go up to 10. Yeah. You know, you just, I don't care how big your lungs are and how much air you have uh, until you learn how to play softer and deal with that in a different way. There's no competition. You can't win, you yeah. know? So the only thing you can do is when you get tired, you adjust. And I take it down an octave, whatever. And at that time, I was still smoking and playing smaller uh, equipment. I was playing like, uh, I, I, I don't know the numbers of, of the, the bore size, but it was more like a medium bore rather than large bore. Uh, and the mouthpiece was a, a, a 10 and a half C rather than the, the uh, Claude Gordon CG personal that I'm using now which is conical shape with, with uh, you know, almost no re resistance at all. In fact, no resistance. You, you blow and the air doesn't stop until it hits a wall yeah. or somebody ears, you know, and you go, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, and it takes as much air as you can possibly put in it. And the more air that you have, it will accept all of that too. And the Claude Gordon horn that I started using, uh, and, and eventually stopped smoking as well in 1991. So, oh, I, it, and then along with the stopping smoking and doing the breathing exercises in, incrementally and building that up, uh, um, it was a lot easier to play and be consistent all the way through the show and, and be strong all the way up until the end. So uh, it, it was great. The one thing that I didn't unlearn and I just started learning, unlearning it like a couple of years ago after I started doing the uh, benefits for cancer uh, and uh, the, the, the cancer. Yeah. yeah. I started watching those guys and then I saw a, a video of you and you were saying to, to start, just start very softly. And then I saw a video of Wayne uh, Bergeron saying the same thing just getting that first note it's got to be right in the right spot you know and and then you expand from there half step at a time and very softly and that has been working for me 
to where now I'm, uh, we, we played a show way back when in, at, uh, in uh, Atlantic City. We played three shows a day, 45 minutes, and I beat myself up that weekend to the point where I, you know, put it, uh, damaged my lip. Yeah. And I have been trying to unlearn that for the rest of the career. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't shove it down to your throat where your chops are bleeding. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know how many trumpet players have done that, but as I listened to some of the, these 30 guys that I was playing with on the stage, they have similar stories. Yeah, They had to play through that and unlearn the damage and, and repair the damage that they did to their chops. And it's always repairable. It's yeah. amazing. You know, it's miraculous, really. But uh, you keep doing the right stuff, you'll get through it. And uh, with the Claude Gordon method, it it works. It works. So with the things, with had you heard about the? I'm sure um, Paul explained it to you about like the tongue level and the K tongue modifieds, single tonguing. Had you ever heard about that before, or and what was no, that like? When I first met him, we didn't really talk. That we just talked trumpet, and he was asking the kind of you know stuff that I do, and I was telling. Him, and I was telling them my fears of going back out on the road where I, you know, I'm playing stuff that's, that's harder now in the studio, knowing full well, the way I'm playing, once I get out on the road, I'm not going to be able to be consistent with that. So, and he said, well, you know, I, uh, Claude Gordon would probably, Arnold Jacobs, he mentioned Arnold Jacobs. And uh, you mentioned, we probably talked about breathing exercises or something. And, you know, when you first hear about it, you're going, yeah, you know, you know, it's like, whatever. And he yeah. told me about Claude Gordon books. And I said, you know what? I think I have one of those already. And, you know, I, I had the, the, the routine. So I started, I, I went home and I said, yeah, let me, let me go through the books. So I would go through and start playing stuff in the books and go from from one lesson to the next just playing right not knowing how to play it correctly so i called paul at at some point and i said yeah you know i'm i'm playing along with the books and uh and and i told him how i was doing and he said you know if you have time and and you want to maybe you know we could get together and i could show you how because you probably don't really want to do it the way you're doing it right now just go you know page to page uh you know during one lesson you want to you want to take it down a little more and i can show you how to use each page yeah and i went okay you know so i went over to paul's house and i ended up studying with him for i think seven years cool <laughs> yeah it was great every time we'd come home off the road i'd go i'd go see paul and you know i had the metronome and you know just incrementally doing what needs to be done yeah and he write everything out big breath chest up big breath play <laughs> <laughs> but prepare first you know same way a shooter when a shooter goes out on the range prepare you know you get your feet planted first then you bring it up to the chest and then you go out and aim then you squeeze without moving the without going oh my god the gun is gonna you know right yeah you do the same thing with trumpet playing you get ready for it first you raise your chest you take a breath bring up the horn bang yeah Play. you know yeah and there's a lot more involved beyond that but it's as simple as chest up big breath play so when you when you start doing some of those exercises and uh, the 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 tongue level and the this new way of tonguing that at some point you and Paul I know got into that but what do you remember that was different like what like we were talking about this earlier like what how would you describe it like before and versus after you changed things well before I was tonguing with the the like I, I'm pretty sure it's in the Schlossberg book that the, the initial attack 
should be with the tip of the tongue up off the the roof of the mouth, the the uh, behind the upper teeth, ta, ta, and uh, that's how I did it all the way up until I met Paul. And he said, try doing it with the the your the tip of your tongue uh, at on the bottom teeth, and do the attack with the fat of the tongue off the roof of the mouth, the K tongue modified. Yeah, uh, and I started. Started doing that <laughs> and changed everything. It changed everything. It was like miraculous. I went, oh, you know, this this is so good. I see that my double tonguing and triple tonguing are going to get so much better uh, immediately, and they did. You know, so <clears throat> that that sold me on taking lessons with Paul. I'm going to be learning something here. That yeah. I've ne I've never had before. So uh, as I studied with Paul, obviously, um, you know, the K tongue modified was a major proponent of how the trumpet is played yeah. in, in natural manner. And uh, well, I feel like when when I've switched people to that and with my own playing, I feel that it's like you really feel like you own each note. You gotta pick your trumpet up, you hit a high C or high F, and it's like it's right there. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's like no fear about it. You're like it's gonna come out. Yeah, you know? and and each note has its place. Right, it's a little groove of where that note is, and uh, you know, keep doing things right enough times. It's it's hard to screw up. It's harder, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can still grow up and you know blow yourself out and all of the things that we all do and uh, uh, but it's harder to do it the more times you do it right right and more times that you know you're doing it right uh, you know I, I I've had so many problems with with people going well you mean you're still practicing you, you haven't got it like right now <laughs> no still practicing I'm gonna practice today you're gonna to practice today again yeah <laughs> i'm gonna practice I'm, as soon as we're done with the interview i start warming up okay? yeah that's awesome saturday right so it's like, Not a day. No. it's like it it practice becomes more fun you know because it's like oh yeah. it's like you're learning new things every day and it's getting easier and it's cool you learn new things every day uh do something a little further or longer than you did the the previous time a lot of times it's only as far as you've gone before but sometimes you go a little bit further or a little bit higher or a little bit easier or that the tongue I, oh i see where that tongue you know you, you watch the tongue level and because by the time you go out and play on the road you're not watching anything you're just playing right and the more you do it right the more times you do it consistently right, when you're in the heat of playing a song and you need to, you know, or you turn the page and that high note is right there. You got the air, it's already prepared. You put the tongue in the right place and play the note, you know, or play the passage or whatever. I don't care how hard it is, you can pull it off. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you can start taking it for granted, but don't do that because it can go away just as easily. Yeah, well, start, I, don't know, I don't know if and, you saw, there was an interview I did recently with um, Frank Cataravic. I think I told you I was mm -hmm. going to do that. He's 94. And I saw, watched it. Yeah, and he was, I mean, he's, he was, even though he's 94, he act, acts like he doesn't play his trumpet that much, but his daughter, when we went upstairs and had watermelon afterwards she's like oh dad practices every day still right. <laughs> play scales. yeah those my I, I have the i have the the scale book right about 10 feet from me right now yeah you go back and you play the stuff that you know you need you know yeah. you need the string and you know you, you know it it goes away if you don't keep doing it yeah but i think the 
you're now you are you 76 now yeah yeah and you're still getting better so that's that's pretty cool pretty crazy yeah yeah, yeah that's my, awesome going, yeah you know i i can see they can you know that they wonder how i'm doing it so easily how uh you know uh and it as you get older, you start feeling more things and it's not as easy as it was, but you get up on stage and people in the audience and my kids are going, man, where do you get all that energy? You know, prepare, you, you keep preparing. I prepare for the shows. Right. You know? When you do the right stuff, you can be ready. Right. Well, this is this is pretty cool. I'm glad we finally got to talk. And yeah, it's always great talking with you because I mean the thing that I was thinking too is like going to your concerts, the it the music always my impression of it is it, it always makes everyone happy. Like the audience feels I sense it like the audience is like happy with all your music. It's yeah. It's always a fun concert, and I think yeah. that's one of the cool things about the band Chicago. It's cool, uplifting music. It's neat, right? And and it's very musical. And yeah. uh, you know, when we play with other bands, they comment on it being musical. You know, and when uh, somebody comes in to do a, a sub, and you know, like a keyboard player or something, like. Uh, uh, Carlos uh, Morea, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce his name. He just played a tour with us, and uh, is he the percussionist or the drummer? Oh, he's a keyboard player and singer. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, uh, he he said when I started, I listened to Call on Me, you know, since I was a kid, and the first time I played it, and I went, man, these changes are like, you know, it's it's not like four five one, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you hit that, you know uh, the changes, and then you make key changes before the first verse. It's like you know bands don't write songs like that, and and uh, we've been consistently doing stuff like that since the beginning, and it's it's normal for us, but it uh, uh, changed the way people. Uh, I think write music a lot of uh, changed the way a lot of writers approached songwriting, and uh, a lot of you get like a lot of you guys have written, taken turns writing the different songs. How did you get into the writing and the arranging part of it? Like when you when was like the first thing that you wrote with a band, and how did you get into that? Calling me was the first song that I wrote for the band, and uh, had you ever tried anything like that? Before? No, no. Uh, uh I was playing guitar. I, I was uh, rooming with Terry, and Terry always had a guitar, always playing guitar, no matter where we were, what we were doing. He would, the, as soon as we would settle in, put the bags down, he'd pull the guitar out and start playing. So I learned a lot of stuff, just positioning and and, and stuff from him. So a lot of a lot of changes I learned from him. And then when I was on my own, I just started playing one day and, you know, that all of a sudden that minor nine starts coming out and, da, 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 and it started falling into place. Lyrically is always been more difficult for me. Uh, I always, I'm normally write the music first and, and then, and then struggle with putting lyrics together. But, uh, <laughs> I ended up putting the, the song and lyrics together and then I I made sort of a demo of it and, and showed it to the guys in the band. But we had already uh, recorded uh, six albums. So, uh, you know, Saturday in the Park was written, Beginnings, Time, uh, Question 67, 68. Uh, uh, I, I, Jimmy, I think Jimmy had done... Uh, just you and me by then too. It wasn't that on six. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't. Re I think just you and me was on six. But anyway, these guys are major songwriters, and I, I walk in with my song. And, I have a new song. You can hear my. <laughs> so not really confident. Yeah. <laughs> thought I had. <laughs> but 
but it, as it turned out, uh, it came out pretty good. Yeah. Sitara and great vocal. Jimmy wrote an incredible horn part. And uh, there you go. You know, that's we're still, still doing it today. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm like a two hint wonder with uh, Carl and, <laughs> Carl and me and, uh, and No Tell Lover. Yeah. Uh, uh, Danny and uh, Peter Cetera. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Well, what a life. Who knew? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> well, and I came up differently than almost every other trumpet player you could ever talk to because everyone has come up and had to, in order to survive, play with all sorts of other bands, big bands where they're one of five or at least one of four uh, sharing parts. Who's going to do the, the lead stuff? Who's going to hand it off? You know, the, the lead player gets to rest for a certain amount of time so that by the end he can come in and wham those those high notes yeah. and uh, me i'm playing everything all right. the time you know so i start with the the background stuff with the you know the uh with, with the the uh, uh whole notes and then we play the the uh ensemble parts and once the ensemble part is done, then you go back to the whole notes or the backgrounds or, or whatever it is. And you come up and sing a background vocal and then you get back and, and but it doesn't stop. And it's like, you know, uh, other players come up and say, it's, that's so cool how you can go from one thing and, and go all through it. And it's, it's like normal for me. Right. And it's not normal for me to sit in a big band and figure out how to how to share parts with other guys i've never yeah. done that yeah so but i admire obviously what they do it's like i aspire to be that good as, as good as those players are because uh you know technically in many ways they they outshine me all over the place and i'm still shooting for that you know so <laughs> that's where i'm headed <laughs> oh dallas <laughs> <laughs> and no. high notes aren't the only thing you know high, high notes are are just a one part of the whole uh shooting match right well i thought one of my favorite parts of your last concert i forgot the tune but there was like a a latin tune that you were doing in part of it probably mongo Mongo nucleosis. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. I hadn't really yeah. heard you guys play anything like that, but right. I like I liked it that it, it's like you guys do such a big variety of different things too. So it's pretty right. cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things that sets us apart from other bands. Is you know we're not a blues band. We're not a any. We're not. You can't put us into a, a you know any particular genre. Right. We play. And uh, we we have the uh, the musicianship to be able to sound different from one song to the next. Yeah. Well, and it's got an appeal to it that I mean I think even some of my younger students that are in high school know your songs. You know, it's like yeah. where they don't know some of these other people that have that have long gone. You know, I'll tell you yeah. my, my daughter. She's seventeen it's she's into ballet and everything the things that she wants to put on the radio are like earth wind and fire in chicago and i was that's, like really <laughs> that's kind of cool it. yeah <laughs> so we're riding in the car that's what we're listening to and i say well you pick what you want <laughs> and that's what she picks so yeah. that's cool i still listen to the beatles a lot the beatles station yeah i, I just did in in my studio here in sedona i did i did a a, a cover of uh, Magical Mystery Tour, and then I brought some of the other guys in after we had the basic. Oh, that's and, pretty cool. And, and then I uh, uh, did an interview with the Beatles station with uh, Tom Frangioni and and uh, all the guys, just like four guys doing the interview. And uh, they introduced Magical Mystery Tour, Chicago version, to play on the Beatles station. Oh, and cool. 
when I did the interview, what I didn't realize, nobody told me that it was going to be a surprise and they were going to announce, you know, the Magical Mystery Tour was a, a, a surprise play. And, that, you know, I was just on to do an interview. They didn't, you know, they, I wasn't supposed to tell them. That. <laughs> but I didn't, I used to doing interviews and sort of leading people along. Yeah. I didn't, nobody told me this is a secret and they're going to, uh, surprise everyone and uh, so i'm not sure if they're upset with me or not <laughs> <laughs> sure they're fine so you tell, me, you tell me before about like your in your house where you put in your studio and stuff so do you do the engineering yourself and when you're recording uh, no no yeah. but now i can actually touch the board whereas i i you know the only the engineer could touch the board before now i own the board <laughs> So I can actually make the moves myself, and yes, <laughs> I do some, uh, but uh, the, I don't. I'm not an engineer, and okay. that takes that whole another lifetime learning that. Yeah. You know, the so when you, guys, when you guys record, you'll you'll hire in an engineer to come in and do it while you're recording. I have an engineer who actually lives at the studio, Tim Jessel. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. It's amazing how that's worked out, and you know, there's. Um, uh, we're figuring out how he's going to still be able to make money because he's able to stay there and, and uh, work consistently and, uh, uh, you know, rent free. So yeah. it's pretty cool. You yeah. Know? And, uh, but also it's a lot of work. Yeah. You know? so, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun and it's something that both of us have always wanted. So, uh, and he's got great ears, a great, uh, he comes from a musical family and uh, what what you hear we can create that's awesome. you know, anything that you might hear anything you might want to do we can figure out how to do it that's cool very cool very neat well uh, it was great doing this I hope you have a good rest of the day practicing right thank you Jeff <laughs> we'll talk soon I'll, I'll send you a link to this once I post it I'll put it on on YouTube I'll probably person. never look at it. I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> Brian over here, you too. You don't even you know. <laughs> but it is. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's where, I mean, it's like, that's where I'm so passionate about it because I want people to know how easy this can be to play, you know? And yeah, I'm, I, but you have, you have to know certain things to make it easier. Right, you like, can hard too. Like, like I told you, some of it, like Doc and you, were the reason why I wanted to play trumpet. But yeah, this, this is real. I'm not a natural. So my parents got me a trumpet, rented it when I was in fourth grade, and they brought it home. I could, I could not make a sound out of the trumpet. I was like, and oh. each of them picked it up and blew a sound out of it. My two sisters, <laughs> and they're like, "What's wrong with you? Should we return the trumpet?" And I, I think I probably started crying. I was like, no, I want to play so bad. Yeah, that's and amazing. So I plugged away at it. And I felt like, I mean, there were times in my trumpet playing that I was just so frustrated at it that oh, yeah. I, I couldn't believe, like, what's wrong with me, you know? And like so that first buzz, when that first buzz came, it's probably, uh, oh, my God, I got the note. Yeah, it was exciting. And... And then I had a friend that the two of us kind of went back and forth challenging each other and getting first chair and him and me and all that. Right. But it it really it really wasn't until the Claw Gordon stuff and some of the stuff was explained to me. I was like, whoa, this is easier. This works. I want to tell yep. people about this because this is cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah, this this is worthy of, of being told to other people. Right. And do it right in order to and you know and that's something just, that's some of the purpose behind all this stuff that i want people to say look this really works check it out and and it's going to work if you just plug away at it long enough yep. I oh think yeah too many people like i go to different things like the international trumpet guild events and stuff and people get sidetracked on mouthpieces and gadgets and all these other things oh yeah if you just know how to practice 
it will get you so much further and just i've never that i've never uh uh gone overboard on size and a size of bore and and whatever i've been playing i've been playing the cg horn the since 41 right elmer yeah from, you know since i met paul and i got another one exactly like it so when i have this one repaired i use the other one it's yeah. it's like a copy of of this one and i use the same mouthpiece i have a, a cg personal for each horn yeah. and i use a CG personal for the flugel horn i use a cg personal for the uh the c trumpet and for the piccolo trumpet yeah and and you know I don't change around and so many players. I mean, Wayne, uh, big band players, there's, there are great reasons and necessary reasons why they need to change their equipment and figure out how to figure out how to do all that stuff. But for me, I play the, the, the one thing and people are surprised at the, the, the size of the equipment that I use and you know, the, that figure if it's, it would be smaller, it would be easier. I found that it's easier to play with the big equipment. And I, if you have I enough agree. air, if if you have enough air and learning the new stuff that I'm learning now with the playing softer and just getting that tone going and then adding air from there, but you've you've got the buzz going and now I'm using, uh, you know, like I said, uh, unlearning the mistake that I made back in 1969. Where, where I screwed up my chops, that is like repairing itself incrementally. It's like, you know, you can't do this because it was scar tissue and stuff, you know, but you can play right, you can play through it. Right. And I'm, yeah. I'm doing it. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, we'll talk yeah. more. I know. I always enjoy talking with you. So I'm glad we got to actually record this on video. So it's cool. Uh, <laughs> all right. Hey. You have thank a great you. day and have thank fun practicing. Okay, Thanks thank you very much. See you, Thanks, Jeff. Lee. Bye. Bye.